on this Sunday night, the struggle to survive inside a Gaza hospital. The life and death battle for newborns as incubators lay idle. So Shifa Hospital now is out of service. This is the situation. The escalating humanitarian crisis as medics fight to save patients without power. Ceasefire now! Demonstrations in 40 locations across Canada calling for a ceasefire. The non-stop bombing, a four-hour ceasefire, it's ridiculous. And a Montreal Jewish school is hit by gunshots again. Canadian fashion mogul Peter Nygaard guilty of sexual assault. This is a battle won in a much bigger war. What his son says happened when he spoke out against his dad. And how dust from 66 million years ago changed life as we know it. Global National with Farah Nasser. Good evening. 234 Canadian citizens, residents and their families left Gaza today through the Rafah border crossing. That's according to Global Affairs Canada and it's in addition to the 107 people who crossed into Egypt last week. Inside the enclave, health care is crumbling. The World Health Organization says Gaza's largest hospital is not a functioning hospital anymore. The head of the WHO says the world cannot stand silent while hospitals, which should be safe havens, are transformed into scenes of death, devastation and despair. And we want to warn you again tonight that some of the images you're about to see in our coverage will be difficult to watch. According to the WHO, the Al-Shifa hospital has faced three days without electricity, power, with constant gunfire and bombings in the area. The Israeli military says it has opened a corridor for anyone who wants to leave, but the aid group Doctors Without Borders says its staff has witnessed people being shot at outside and that it's too dangerous to go outside to help them. As Danielle Hamamjan reports, what is clear is the sickest in Gaza are not getting the medical help they need not even the youngest patients. Some of these babies, likely all of them, are younger than the war itself. There is now not enough electricity left to power the generators. It means having to take the newborns off their incubators. Doctors at Al-Shifa Hospital say the women's ward was bombed, and so here they are, sleeping next to each other on a single bed. At least three have died. Staff say they expect to lose more day after day. We are uh, nearly sure that we are alone now. No one hears us. But we want someone to give us the guarantee that we can evacuate the patient. Satellite images show the destruction of hospitals in the enclave. Shifa is the largest of them all. Doctors Without Borders says medics and patients are trapped inside due to heavy clashes around the hospital complex. Even if you are wounded or injured or in the Gaza area, you cannot be evacuated by ambulance to Shifa Hospital. So Shifa Hospital now is out of service. This is the situation. But the Israeli military offers a different account, claiming it supplied 300 liters of fuel for urgent medical purposes. Here's a video it says shows Israeli troops placing jerry cans near the hospital, as had been coordinated in advance with officials at Al-Shifa. Israel says Hamas then prevented the medical center from receiving them. It has also repeatedly claimed that Hamas's headquarters are located under the hospital. The focus of the Israeli military campaign, one bolstered by weapons supplied by its staunchest ally. But the U.S. is warning Israel. We do not want to see a firefight in a hospital where innocent people, helpless people, uh, people seeking medical care are caught in the crossfire. The Al-Quds hospital also announced it was out of service and still in northern Gaza and in the dark. Surgeries at the Indonesian hospital are being carried out in corridors. That's Mossab Sobiyah's little body on the floor. Doctors tried to save his life using a manual resuscitator. And they succeeded. Over the past few days, more than 100,000 residents have been forced to flee south, not knowing if or when they'll ever return. Parents do not know what to tell their children. The anger is not only directed at Israel. 
This is not a way to live. The Arab world has let us down, he says. Why don't they come and help rid us of the occupation that is bombing us left and right? The whole world has let us down, he says. The progressive world that boasts about human rights has let us down. Over the weekend, Israel said its forces would take the babies from Al-Shifa hospital to safety, but now claim they've not been told how to get them out. There are at least 40 newborn babies off incubators, and Farah, the clock is ticking. It certainly is. Danielle Hamamjan in Jerusalem tonight. Thank you, Danielle. As Israel lays siege on Gaza, there are more signs the situation is escalating beyond it. On the border between Israel and Lebanon, Israeli forces exchanged gunfire and bombardments with Hezbollah fighters. This after the Iran-backed militant group fired missiles upon Israeli border villages. More than a dozen people were injured, including Israeli troops. It's the latest skirmish after weeks of fighting in the region triggered by the crisis. And in Europe, the conflict is further opening bitter divisions. Across France, tens of thousands of people marched against anti-Semitism following a rise in hate incidents. And in the UK, there is more political fallout after police arrested far-right protesters looking to interrupt a pro-Palestinian march this weekend. In both countries, many citizens are closely watching the words and the actions of their politicians on this very contentious issue. Redmond Shannon reports. French politicians of different stripes belt out the national anthem, La Marseillaise, at the start of a march against anti-Semitism. Among them, the leader of the far-right national rally party, Marine Le Pen. We are exactly where we should be, she said. Le Pen's father and party founder Jean-Marie Le Pen was repeatedly accused of anti-Semitic views during his career. At the other end of the political spectrum, however, Jean-Luc Mélenchon did not attend. The left-wing leader said the event was for, quote, unconditional supporters of the massacre of Gazans. The decisions of both politicians reflecting deepening divisions on the Middle East across much of Europe. In London, King Charles laid a wreath at the city's main cenotaph for the traditional Remembrance Sunday event. It was the site of these clashes between far-right protesters and police during Saturday's commemorations. The group tried to storm the cenotaph, supposedly to protect it. Others attempted to intercept London's pro-Palestinian march before being arrested. Opposition politicians accused the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, of inciting the clashes. Her ministry is in charge of policing, but on Wednesday she accused officers of bias toward pro-Palestinian protests and Braverman used similar language to Ontario Premier Doug Ford labelling them hate marches. We have a Home Secretary whose job it should be to ensure that tensions are simmered down, has spent the entire week fanning the flames of division. London police did also arrest some pro-Palestinian protesters in relation to hate crime offences. But regardless of what political leaders say and do, it should be worth noting one thing. The vast majority of those taking to the streets on both sides of the English Channel this weekend did so peacefully. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Dozens of demonstrations were held across Canada today calling for peace in the region. The group called Ceasefire Now planned the day of action with more than 40 pro-Palestinian rallies planned in various parts of the country today. The most important point for today is to call for ceasefire, to call on our officials to have the courage to call for a ceasefire. I'm here to fight for the rights of uh, the Palestinian people to live, uh, their right to be free, their right to have their own land. Islamophobia and anti-Semitism are both on the rise across Canada, as are hate crimes. A Jewish school in Montreal is dealing with a second incident within just a few days. Mackenzie Gray reports. For the second time in less than a week, a brazen display of anti-Semitism in Montreal. An early morning shooting at a Jewish school 
that had been targeted just days before. They want to try and scare us into closing our schools, into not educating our children. They will fail. Our school has been here for 75 years. Montreal police say they were called at 5 a.m. to the Yeshiva Gadola Jewish School. Bullet holes riddled the facade, but no one was inside or injured. Witnesses told police they saw a vehicle speeding off after the shots were fired. This, what happened today, it's not Montreal. We don't want people in Montreal. We don't want Montrealers to, to feel unsafe in their city. This is absolutely unacceptable. No arrests have been made, but police are now investigating it as a hate crime. Just like the probe into a Molotov cocktail being thrown at a southwestern Montreal synagogue on November 7th. We will, of course, have more security, but also I'm definitely telling them that uh, the, well, the perpetrator of, of what happened will be, there will be consequences. Tensions are also high in the nation's capital. No one was hurt when gasoline was poured in a clinical area of the Ottawa General Hospital on Thursday, accompanied by a message discussing the ongoing conflict in Gaza, according to police. And an Ottawa mosque had feces smeared on it in late October. The video caught on CCTV. What's been happening, uh, you know, particularly what we saw in Montreal last week. Uh, on the West Block with Mercedes Stevenson, the government house leader calling for calm. I think really importantly to create that space for dialogue, to make sure that we continue to see and view each other as fellow Canadians. Conservative leader Pierre Polyev labeling the unknown perpetrators of the shooting as terrorists. Our school, Yeshiva Godola of Montreal, has been the target of a terrorist attack. I say again, a terrorist attack. That sentiment is supported by some backbench Liberal MPs, but so far, no word on what the Prime Minister thinks, Farah, as Justin Trudeau has not made a public statement on the shooting. Mackenzie Gray in Ottawa. Thank you, Mackenzie. Jurors have found former Canadian fashion mogul Peter Nygaard guilty of four counts of sexual assault. He was acquitted on a fifth count and a charge of forcible confinement. Mike Trollet with the jury verdict reached this morning in Toronto. Guilty. He's guilty. Shannon Maroney broke the news to Peter Nygaard's victims, women she had worked with as a trauma therapist, their stories now validated by guilty verdicts on four counts of sexual assault. He was acquitted on one count of sexual assault and one of forcible confinement. It's relief, it's victory, it's joy, it's pain, it's disappointment. Nygaard, the 82-year-old former fashion mogul, was a self-made millionaire who lived a jet-set lifestyle surrounded by models and celebrities. Also in court today, his son Kai, who says he was silenced by lawyers and disinherited by his father in 2019 when he tried to come forward as a whistleblower. He says he felt vindicated when civil suits were launched six months later against a man he now calls a monster. I loved my father. It hurts me to see all of these things. I knew a different man, but when you get the reveal that there is another person, there's another personality within there, there's something evil in there, there's something perverse, there's something sick. Over the past six weeks, the jury heard from five women who testified they visited Nygaard's Toronto office under the pretense of a tour or job interview. Each recalled being invited to Nygaard's top floor bedroom suite where they testified they were sexually assaulted. When Nygaard took the stand, he said he didn't recall ever meeting four of the five women. In closing arguments, the Crown said similarities in their testimony defy coincidence, while the defense called their stories revisionist history and totally preposterous, suggesting most of the complainants were part of a class action lawsuit filed against Nygaard in the U.S. Complicating matters, the alleged assaults happened from the 1980s to the mid-2000s, leading to some witness inaccuracies in remembering details. And while the Crown argued that was to be expected, defense lawyer Brian Greenspan argued it wasn't merely flawed recollection, it was Alice in Wonderland. Greenspan says it's too early to say if they'll launch an appeal. His focus right now is to get a favorable jail sentence. Uh, as you've all seen, Mr. Nygaard is, uh, is frail, has uh, numerous health challenges, and that will be part of the uh, position taken. Nygaard's legal journey doesn't end here. He's facing more charges in separate cases in Quebec and Manitoba. And once those trials are complete, he'll be extradited to the U.S. for yet another trial. Mike Drolight, Global News, Toronto. Serving for Canada and being served an eviction notice. Coming up, the plight of a homeless veteran this Remembrance Day weekend. 
A Canadian soldier who's done two tours in Afghanistan is homeless this Remembrance Day weekend. His home seized just as winter sets in. Melissa Ridgen explains. Here is where Sergeant Zach McDermott Fouts' home stood. This would have been the this would have been the front door right here. If the house was still uh, still here, this is kind of where our front door came out. A decade old fight over building permits and what the municipality calls safety concerns with the family of Six's mobile home. When they first said that they would remove the house and tear our garage down, that you know, we've been living here for nine and a half years. Um, it's not that I didn't take it seriously, because I definitely took it seriously. I just thought that it would never get to that point, because, I mean, even, even if you can do something, doesn't mean that you should. My house. But they did. On October 30th, Nicole McDermott Fouts was home with their two youngest when police, movers, and a flatbed truck arrived with a warrant to seize the home. I was actually nursing the baby. <laughs> nursing the baby, and uh, Zach phoned me with a heads up, and... I guess they were already at the gate, and by the time I got off the phone with him, they were at the front door. All she could do was watch from her car. Shut up. She and the kids are staying with family and come to visit their dad, living here in the garage. The rural municipality of Whitehead would not do an interview, but sent Global News a statement from their lawyer saying the property owners were provided appropriate notice and all procedures were followed in accordance with the Municipal Act and bylaws to remove the unpermitted structure. It's the talk of this rural community. Total shock. Can't believe that a house would be taken away from a family. Like overreach, I call it. Bernice Hebert started a GoFundMe for the family. In addition to losing their home, McDermott Fouts and his wife each face a $40,000 fine. The RM is billing them for the movers, storage container, and their legal bills. It's heartbreaking. To see people in different countries who are really live under tyranny, and then to experience a piece of that, not even in, in your, your own country, your own prop, like, but your own home. Oh, well, I found my uniforms. Melissa Ridgen, Global News, near Brandon, Manitoba. Emergency evacuation ahead. Thousands in Iceland flee due to fears of a nearby volcano erupting. A series of earthquakes in southwestern Iceland is sparking fears of a nearby volcano erupting. Seismic activity has cracked open roads in one town, forcing 3,000 residents to move out of the area. The Icelandic Meteorological Office says there's considerable risk of an eruption happening at any time. An aviation alert has also been raised in response. And in India, more than 30 workers are trapped after a tunnel they were working in collapsed in a landslide. Rescue work is underway, but it's expected to take some time. Oxygen is being pumped in through a pipe to help the workers breathe. They have sent signals that they are safe. Across India, lights and oil lamps lit up the sky as millions celebrate Diwali. The Hindu festival symbolizing the victory of light over darkness began today. Festive gatherings and prayers will be held for a period of five days across India and around the world. Next, a new research that shows it was dust that did the dinosaurs in 66 million years ago. And Canada stands alone atop the tennis world. History for Canadian tennis as Canada's women are Billie Jean King Cup champions for the first time ever. Canada has now won both of tennis's most prestigious team tournaments in back-to-back -back years after the men won the Davis Cup for the first time last year. There is new research out of Belgium that's changing our understanding of what caused dinosaurs to go extinct. Heidi Prochetrick reports. Dust. We think of it as an annoyance, an allergen, something to be cleaned up. But new research suggests for dinosaurs, dust meant the difference between life and death. It's indeed a, a thick layer of uh, silky dust uh, debris um, engulfing the whole planet. Scientists from Belgium went to Tanis, a fossil site in North Dakota that serves as a record of the geological effects of the massive Chicxulub asteroid, which hit Earth 66 million years ago, triggering the dinosaurs' mass extinction. They found a layer of ultrafine silicate dust there and decided to explore its role in that end. 
the first idea was to combine uh, these, these unique information coming from the field with our uh, newly developed um, computer simulations. We've taken their animation of that simulation and enhanced it to illustrate. According to their work, when the asteroid slammed into the planet, it threw up such a plume of this dust that it enveloped the entire Earth in just over a week, blocking out the sun, halting the photosynthesis essential for life. Think of it like this dust storm in China a few years back, but for two whole years. It's time scale. Uh, is indeed quite long to pose severe challenges uh, for uh, life in the aftermath of chicks group impact. And that basically causes the collapse of food chains, both on land and in the water. It means whatever the asteroid didn't kill in its fiery impact died later of the long-term effects. It was the dust, they say, lingering another 15 years that played the biggest role in dropping Earth's temperature by as much as 15 degrees Celsius. And animals are not good at dealing with that. So um, you just end up with these multiple cascading reasons for a mass extinction. An extreme example, she says, of what rapid climate change can do. A reason why scientists monitor asteroids in our present day solar system for prevention after the big one left dinosaurs in the dust. Heidi Petrachik, Global News, Halifax. And that's Global National for this Sunday night. I'm Farah Nasser. Tonight's Air Canada is La Peche River in Wakefield, Quebec. Donna will be back with you tomorrow. Until next time, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Good night. <laughs>